Hello and welcome to this episode of uh, Global Review, where we take a uh, review of the last week's uh, key headlines and of course the developments uh, that are there. We try to present to you uh, the economic analysis, the analysis that requires vigorous academic take on some of these developments. I am Sachin Chaturvedi presenting this show. Let us see the headlines. India and France uh, sign 14 agreements. Uh, partnership reaches new heights. Kenyan president reaches out to opposition, now in agreement for peace. Removal of term limits in China enables Xi Jinping to remain president indefinitely. UK will sell weapons to Saudi Arabia. Uh, the quantum may be as high as of $6.3 billion. Debt toll rises to 1,000 in Syria's eastern uh, Gota. US blames Russia uh, for breaching the ceasefire. CIA director uh, Mike Pompeo takes over in place of uh, Tillerson when Trump has got rid of his own foreign minister. Now, let's have a look at uh, uh, the next uh, section of this program in which we bring in stories at length to you in terms of analyzing in cross the globe. In Sri Lanka, the crisis has deepened. Let's have a look at this report. The violence in Sri Lanka was triggered by death of a Sinhalese Buddhist truck driver after being beaten by a group of Muslim men over a traffic dispute on 22nd February in Kandy City. He succumbed to his injuries on 3rd March. An emergency was declared nationwide on 6th March by Sri Lankan President. <laughs> Mewani Sidwi Mulata Mulu, Kumanho Parsevega, Puddelain, Sangidana, Kandayam, a Sialatama Virudda, Daddy Lesser, Niti Mevashin Kriakali to Bava, Ma Polisiata, Upadesti Tibera. Make a disbal no sing, Damia Mayata, Unakamatibuna, the Kaker, Chudana, Idripatala, Agabira Ganda, a bit of Padilu Yanduna, be home Padilu. Kandy is the prime destination for foreign traveler, famous for his tooth temple in honor of Buddha, tea gardens and natural beauty. In an earlier incident in 2014, three individuals from the Muslim community had died and since then, tensions have risen between the communities. Previously, the heterogeneous island population faced a 26-year-long civil war, which ended in 2009. Apart from declaring curfew, the state even blocked social media websites. 81 people, including the main suspect, Vira Singhe, have been arrested by the Terrorism Investigation Division. Sri Lankan Prime Minister said that 465 places of worship, houses, vehicles, business facilities and other institutions were damaged during the incidents. As life in Kandy is moving towards normalcy, the tension seems to have eased and the schools have also been reopened in Kandy city. So this uh, crisis right in our neighbourhood has deepened. Today to discuss this and the other stories with us, uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Mohan Kumar, who is an eminent commentator on international affairs. He was our ambassador in, in Paris. Welcome, sir, to this show. We also have uh, uh, Professor Shiram Cholia, who is an eminent international commentator. His writings are all across. We are very privileged to have you here today with us. Dr. Mohan Kumar, I would like to have your comment first on how you look at these developments in Sri Lanka. You have served in Sri Lanka. What memories are coming back to us and, and to your mind? What do you think uh, uh, is, is the key behind this? So thank you very much for having me on the program. My first um, uh, reaction is that of all countries uh, 
in the neighborhood. Uh, this is one country that has paid a huge price uh, for ethnic conflict. I remember that uh, Sri Lanka, when it achieved its independence and soon thereafter, it bid fair to be as good, if not better, than Singapore. It had a lot of potential. So I think every Sri Lankan deep inside knows that they have paid a high price uh, in terms of development at the cost of ethnic conflict. So I'm reasonably sure that saner voices will prevail. And indeed, there is evidence. One of the things that we are hearing is that the emergency will not be extended indefinitely. So um, I think uh, they will sort it out. I think what needs to be borne in mind, though, is that to begin with, every Muslim was actually a Tamil. Every mm. Muslim speaks Tamil in Sri Lanka. Yeah. So the Muslim identity came a little later. And that happened for a variety of reasons uh, in the world and in Sri Lanka. So I um, conclude my remarks by expressing the hope and the conviction that I think they will they will tide it they over. They will come out of. They this. will tide it over. That's, that's my sense. Shriram, what is your take? How you look at this conflict, which is uh, now pervading across different regions? It's not confined to Kandy alone. How you look at uh, these developments? That's right, Sachin. In fact. Uh, uh, some uh, small scraps have also happened in Ampare, which is in the east of the yeah. country, where there is a significant Muslim uh, community. I think um, this is this. Uh, if we trace it back structurally, uh, some scholars have called uh, Sri Lanka one of the cases of a, an ethnocracy, as in a democracy, but where the majoritarian uh, politics has overshadowed minority rights to the point where you know there is a sharp segregation and very less intermixing between the communities. If you see the population composition, around 70% are, are, are Sinhalese. Are Sinhalese. Yeah. And then you have around 12% uh, to 13% uh, Tamils. Tamils. And almost 9 to 10% Muslims. And as so Mohan that's is, the broad. And as Mohan is saying, at one point, they were all Tamil-speaking minorities. That's but right. now the Muslims have formed their own identity because during the civil war, the LTT, the Liberation Tigers, they had attacked and evicted Muslims from a number of northern and eastern uh, provinces. Mm -hmm. So now we have a situation where the war with the Tamil Tigers is over, uh, and but still the mobilization on the base of ethnicity for political gain as well as for social polarization has increased so much that some people, are, some scholars argue that now we have a, the, the Buddhist fundamentalism, that's a unique phenomenon here and in Myanmar, unfortunately, is looking for a new other to assert itself. And now that the Tamils have, be, uh, militancy has been vanquished, they have fallen on the Muslims, it seems. Yeah. That is one of the views. Hmm. Of course, uh, the Sri Lankan government does have a point that there may be some uh, elements uh, among the Muslim community that are also radicalized with foreign funding and so on. But overall, if you look at it, the, my, my main concern is that they have not been able to stitch together a kind of a pluralistic identity. And that is the main deficiency in the nation building. But you know, Shiram, what is bothering me is this new trend we are seeing uh, across Buddhist communities, be that in Myanmar or you see it now in Sri Lanka. It may be reaction to radicalization in other camps, but this radicalization of Buddhism and and it's and, and, and is is surprising and, and shocking. Linked. You see, exactly, uh, uh, it's been f f uh, proven that these Bodhu Balasena and some of these very very extreme right wing groups in uh, Sri Lanka, who are said to be the real forces yeah. behind these uh, mass attacks on Muslims, yeah. are connected to the um, 969 movement in Myanmar, where they have been attacking Rohingya and so on. So, and and if you go further, you find a similar trend uh, that uh, during uh, Takshin Shinawatra's regime, we in saw Thailand in also, southern exactly. Thailand. So, There's a so, so, so you find a greater trend. It may be in response to radicalization in the Muslim community, but I think somewhere Asia would have to see how we prevent this the key uh, disease is the in, in terms of uh, see, uh, Mohan spreading. will remember. Uh, even the uh, the problem that started in the 1980s, a lot of it is linked to mobilization of voters because uh, the Sinhalese mainstream parties rely, like Mahindra Rajapaksha, the current opposition leader who's likely to make a comeback, is said to be somehow supporting the ideology behind, if not directly the attackers, the mobs that are, uh, is supposed to be somehow tacitly endorsing 
these uh, you know buddhist right wing groups and he needs that because to overthrow the unp which is the main opposition which is currently in power and what is interesting is the coalition dynamics that's happening in sri lanka right now it's not stable uh, the unp is allied with the sri lanka freedom party which were historically opponents and mahinda rajapaksa has created his own party and he's making very fast inroads the l- most recent uh, municipal elections show that uh, it's likely that so he may then, come back so uh, then shiram two or three trends are absolutely clear one the divide as uh, uh, ambassador mohan kumar pointed out uh, uh, between the two communities is absolutely uh, there his hope that peace would come back would depend on three factors number one how uh, rajpaksha's politics of uh, consolidation among sinhalese and they as a dominant community exactly. there exactly. emerges number one number two uh, uh, the wider unrest among buddhist communities be that thailand or myanmar or now in sri lanka how that is responding and last and third i think is the is the is the muslim identity which that's is also uh, getting radicalized be that in maldives or in sri lanka further you go up myanmar exactly. and then in and uh, and uh, sachin, in thailand it, and sachin it has reverberations for the tamils too So yes. even though they are not rightly uh, currently impacted by this violence yeah. they are also looking at it with alarm like Sambandhan yeah. who is the head of the Tamil uh, National Alliance hmm. in the North and East has said where is the rule of law i mean it looks like the police are standing by while the singhalese mobs are going about uh, and ransacking muslim homes and attacking them so it's a very serious situation exactly. which has to be it's not only a law and order issue it's a social fabric issue hmm. it's a nation building how issue. do you see dr mohan kumar would would this have imperatives for our own uh, sort of uh, uh uh i think i think you will have to see it in the wider context and as you rightly said there is a trend not just in yes. asia but even beyond asia the lurch towards uh, uh, ethnicity the lack of pluralism so you are seeing some wider trends and i don't see how sri lanka can be an exception the only positive note that i would like to inject is that uh, this president has a reputation for being um, not chauvinistic and i think he has been elected on a platform that is pluralistic so i think his comments so far along with that of the prime minister give me confidence to believe that they will be able to tide over this crisis oh, and true. and this is a country that has paid a very high price i repeat it again mm. you know they paid a huge price yeah. for the problems that they have had in the past i would also not underestimate the role of economics Uh, and uh, you know sri lanka is a, is a relatively open economy tourists tourism is big there so some of the difficulties that are f- that they are facing economically i think is being taken it's advantage of channel, great so with that uh, uh, on that note of positivism we we bring uh, our this section to a uh, 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 close uh, ambassador mohan kumar and in the next section we would be looking at uh, news that is beyond uh, uh the the current emphasis we just finished with international solar alliance what are the key outcomes and and what's the way forward on international solar alliance we would be looking at under the section beyond the news so with this uh we come to an end of this section thank you welcome back in this section we would look at uh the news that made headlines and we would try to see in depth analysis under the section beyond the news we look at solar alliance in the international solar alliance the summit that just got uh, closed last week we would now look at the details of the summit The International Solar Alliance is an alliance of more than 121 countries, most of which lie in the torrid zone, the area between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. They have been aptly referred to as sunshine countries. International Solar Alliance represents three-fourths of the world population, of which 20 to 50 percent of the population do not have access to power. The primary objective of the alliance is to work for efficient exploitation of solar energy to reduce dependence on fossil fuels. 
the International Solar Alliance is conceived as a coalition of solar resource rich countries to address their special energy needs and will provide a platform to collaborate on addressing the identified gaps through a common agreed approach. International Solar Alliance was unveiled by Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the then French President François Hollande at the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris on November 30, 2015. The inaugural International Solar Alliance Summit took place in New Delhi on March 11, 2018. It was attended by French President Emmanuel Macron and leaders from 30 other countries. Till now, 32 countries have signed and ratified International Solar Alliance Framework Agreement. Another 32 countries have already signed and are in the process of ratification. So this extremely important initiative by India and France has attracted global attention. As we introduced, we have Dr. Mohan Kumar to discuss with us and bring in the key points that uh, International Solar Alliance Summit has brought on the table. How do you look at it, uh, uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar, the, the number of countries that participated, the huge quantum of lines of credit which have been sanctioned, and as Prime Minister himself called in, in terms of changing the energy mix across the world? So I'll, I'll take the opportunity, um, because I was fortunate to be ambassador there, when this proposal was conceived. And it was uh, basically the Honorable Prime Minister who felt um, in his own inimitable way that if countries have at least 300 days of sunshine and the sun plays such an important part in our cultures, why not use the sun? He said, why are we going after other things? So that's how we started. But I think it was a lot more shrewder than that. I think he, he understood very quickly that the obstacles to solar energy basically were a, a completely fragmented market, lack of financing. So at a negotiating level, he wanted to send the signal that India will be part of the solution to climate change, not the problem. Mm. Traditionally, right, yeah. traditionally, we have been seen as a country which was a problem in terms of burning coal, in terms of massive emissions, in terms of this huge population which is going to burn even more coal. His basic objective and motivation was, we will be part of the solution, we will take an initiative, a cutting edge initiative on solar energy, and the basic objective really was to form a common solar market. That's right. And with that, uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar, one of the key initiatives that we have is in terms of uh, establishing the Secretariat right in India, which we haven't seen for ages now that India is providing leadership with, as you rightly said, with a solution. In fact, India has extended $1.4 billion line of credit, while France has extended only $1.3 billion line of credit. How you look at this institutional initiative uh, that is associated along with the International Solar Alliance in form of this secretariat, what would be the challenges? See, France was associated with it because France was the chairman of COP21. Plus, France has a lot of real estate in the Indian Ocean, Reunion Island, so they also have a fair degree of sunshine. But essentially, this Franco-Indian initiative or Indo-French initiative, if you like, because we were the pioneers, the challenges now will be to get as many ratifications as possible. We've got about 25, yeah. but I think we need to get more. That is something the Secretariat is working. Most important to my mind will be financing. If we can now go to multilateral financial institutions and say that you are lending not to one country but to 50 countries which will harmonize their policies and regulatory practices and which will constitute this one single solar market then i think the challenge becomes much easier the only other challenge that remains is technological breakthrough which is happening yeah. whether it is battery storage grid uh, grid sharing that is happening I think if we can get rid of the regulatory challenge and make sure financing is available, I think the sky is the limit. Excellent. Uh, Shiram, how you look at the strategic imperatives of this initiative uh, as several of the uh, Francophone African countries and many other African countries attended, uh, even our neighborhood was, 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 was uh, very prominently uh, present here, the president of Sri Lanka, president of Bangladesh, they attended it. How you look at this as a, as a sort of game changer? This is not about 
politics, but uh, really very much about a global challenge all of us are facing. It's indeed a strategic project, uh, Sachin. Uh, an Australian scholar, Ian Hall, uh, says that uh, uh, Narendra Modi has made uh, you know, India a normative power in the world. Like in the past, we of course had a very moral position on many world issues during the Cold War and all that, right? But now, he is, our Prime Minister has essentially you know, thrust our soft power forward through this initiative. As you mentioned, having an intergovernmental organization of such a global scale and vision to be headquartered in India is, and that too achieved within three years, Mohan, since Absolutely. conception to reality. And that's one of the fastest rates at which you convert an idea into a true intergovernmental international organization. Absolutely. So he has done it, and uh, that's, and I think that's part of his vision, and uh, we must acknowledge it. So I think what we are doing is we are, again, reestablishing our uh, role as a major leader of the global south. You know, and in fact, uh, I would want you to uh, explain to the viewers. People often say China is a leader in solar industry. They are making most of the photovoltaic cells. They're selling all over the world. But uh, we are catching up. Uh, some people say that we are the third uh, largest now, beyond uh, behind the U.S. and China in terms of installed solar capacity. And we are overachieving our targets and doing it faster than. So, what is behind this whole, uh, you know, uh, progress? Yeah, I think as, as uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar very rightly said, uh, instead of being naysayer to everything, India has taken a positive lead. A lead in terms of solving the global challenges we are facing, both in, in, uh, in terms of the climate change negotiations, which were stuck, and also in terms of providing a solution. The fact that we have notched above France in terms of extending lines of credit, and the and, and fact that we have been mobilizing through international market this resource. So that sh very much shows India's political commitment and our, our willingness to solve larger global challenges. Yes. The fact that it's a global uh, governance uh, absolutely, contribution, absolutely, a very big one. Yeah. Excellent, and and that I think is also a sort of uh, part of the solution that we have stepped on. So we have gone on another trajectory in terms of both uh, diplomatic exercise, but also in terms of technological solution. Here, as uh, uh, we were discussing, the cost of uh, 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 per unit uh, solar energy is going down. And we entering at this stage is also giving a huge leeway to countries which are already miles ahead of us. Mm. So what India is doing through uh, uh, launching of solar panels across Mozambique and many other African countries is in terms of bringing technology to everyone. And, and our approach is to also uh, you know, appreciate and uh, support other developing countries that are doing well. For example, Kenya has made a huge leaps, uh, as you mentioned, in some parts of Africa, in installation of uh, solar power grids That's and all right. these things. That's right. Through regulations, sure. through yeah. policy. So I think yeah. there's Excellent. a lot to learn so mutually among ourselves in the developing world. In fact, uh, uh, in the next section, we would talk more about the solution that PM himself has proposed in our uh, uh, book review section. Uh, so we would go for the next section now. Welcome back. In this section, we bring out a key resource that we see is important for further analysis of the theme that we have picked up in Beyond the News section. And as you know, in the last section, we discussed uh, issues that are coming out of International Solar Alliance. The book that we have picked up is about how we are coming out in terms of coping up with the climate change. My colleague uh, here, uh, Professor Shiram Cholia, would explain you the book. Shiram. Sachin, this book, uh, authored by our own Prime Minister, uh, is worth reading by every citizen on this planet. Not just we proud Indians, but everyone. Because what he has done is he has combined the moral argument, the technical aspects of going green, as well as you know the issue of climate justice, climate ethics, it's an amazing work because what he has talked about, you know, there are very interesting anecdotes from his own childhood in Gujarat. And he talks about how wind and solar were so integrated into folklore in stories that were being told, uh, you know, to children at home. And how he gives an amazing parable of um, wind and solar being uh, considered to be at rivals to each other in one of the folklore, the local myths. And how it ends up that they are actually uh, powers that will, uh, you know, bring light to everyone, to the whole society. Then he invokes the ancient wisdom of India, the suktas, the Vedas, and all those things, which are very important because, you know, there's a philosophical basis to the Solar Alliance. And what impressed me, Shiram, was in terms of its uh, 
communicative ability to young readers and that i think of is course. is giving a major traction to and this policies, publication again, like, you, you know the kind of policies that are necessary to make these things work one of the myths he breaks in the book is it's not an expensive thing to move to a low carbon future it's a myth right i mean yeah. he has busted the myth and you as an economist you would know that as you were saying the technology is moving the direction so some people need, are visionaries and they see it early yeah. and he did that when he was chief minister of gujarat and in this book he shows how he has also transformed it to the national level uh, you know through policies you know important it's important right it's not yeah. just entrepreneurs and corporates yeah. that do it so we need government policy to support and move Excellent. these transitions forward yeah so now as we come uh, close to our program uh, uh, dr mohan kumar my question to you is in light of the launching of international solar alliance the book that we picked up how you see what should be the sequence of uh, uh, policy responses of course in terms of strengthening the secretariat and also consolidating the effort which has gone in in last week's summit see uh, i think india is well on track to achieving its intended nationally determined contribution the indc yeah. that every country has been asked to do under the climate change agreement i think as uh, professor cholia said we are well on our way to even exceeding those targets yeah. Yeah. so that's not an issue i think uh, the other expression which uh, the honorable prime minister introduced in paris mm. was climate justice mm. and that's important uh, professor chaturvedi because i think the world has to realize that countries can only contribute so much by way of greenhouse gas emissions it is yeah. not that countries have an unlimited claim and we have a challenge ahead of us so i think the battle will now be in the area of financing the battle will be in the area of how much each country has yeah. a right yeah. to produce, produce emissions so i think i yeah. would introduce Excellent. the concept of climate Great. justice really. closing remarks here yeah. as we sachin you know we are owed reparations yeah. by the richer countries and we will continue to fight for that you are experienced in this and i'd like you to have the last word on what we can do to extract some concessions from the richer countries because it seems like right now france is taking the lead but the united states has stepped back and is washing its hands of all that the responsibility that is that is true shiram and i think uh, uh, as we move forward i think india would have the owners of setting up the secretariat which is extremely important connecting countries and of course taking the dialogue forward uh the lead that india has established with prime minister's own commitment and and the book that we picked up today very much illustrates how even uh, uh the the singularity that uh, a pm has brought to this idea of having a solar alliance together very much represents our commitment with this we come back to uh, uh to our uh, uh, viewers i would request you to share your ideas and and suggestions for us uh, uh, to incorporate in this program we come to a close thank you thanks for watching this program